Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and I know what you're thinking. Oh hey, the Green Scorpion is talking about League again! How original! Yes, I know I've pretty much drowned my channel with this Goliath of a MOBA, but I don't really care, honestly. I still love this game. Whether it's the fascinating lore, which is actually shaping up again, the vast array of characters, the balanced gameplay, or my need to overcome the painful ranking system and toxic community, I still find myself coming back for more. I have received requests for a top 15 other favorite League of Legends champions, but I decided to mix it up a bit with a less strenuous topic. Ultimates. Every champion has an ultimate ability, except Udyr apparently, that gives him or her a bit more niche and uniqueness. I've used them, I've dealt with them, and now I'm gonna rank them. Specifically, I'm going to talk about my 15 favorite ultimates in the game, and yes, it is different from my favorite champions, though don't be surprised if I retread some old ground. I'm going to be ranking them based on flash, usefulness in a solo or team situations, how well they fit the character, and how unique they feel. Also, bonus points for any subtle references of the external kind. And keep in mind that these are my personal favorites, not necessarily the best ones. So if your favorite ultimate didn't make the cut, then by all means, let's have a good discussion about it in the comments. But for now, the battle's getting heated and level 6 has been reached. These are my top 15 favorite League of Legends ultimates. Let's get started. Something that you usually want to avoid while playing League of Legends is dying. Yeah, Captain Obvious here, but there's more repercussion to death than you might think. It's not like you just have to wait for a respawn time until you're back in the fray. Dying in League of Legends results in gold for your killer, precious farm loss, and your teammates raging at you like you're the scum of the earth. Usually in solo queue. Several champions have ultimates that can temporarily prevent your untimely demise. Kale's Intervention, Zillion's Chrono Shift, and the recently released Kindred with Lamb's Respite. However, I think the best example is Trinomir's Undying Rage. Putting aside the fact that this ultimate is incredibly useful, Undying Rage is just really intimidating. Fighting Trindamir is hard enough with his monstrous power and high critical hit chance. And just when you think you can kill him, you witness your attacks being rendered futile as Trindamir uses his anger and fury to hang on to an inch of his life as he mercilessly mutilates you. What also makes this ultimate interesting is how to combat it. It's mainly about knowing when Undying Rage will wear off and planning your attacks accordingly. However, you need to think fast, because by the time you've figured it out, the Raging Barbarian is probably already in your face, and he wants to hurt you. This'll be a slaughter. While many ultimates are all-out attacks that tailor to the champion using them, some ultimates in the game branch out by providing something different. Some ultimates are lifesavers like Undying Rage, others cause a crippling status effect, and some are even transformations. However, there's one ultimate that exists purely to augment influences to your basic abilities. Karma's Mantra. I feel I should explain Karma's basic abilities in order to shed the proper light on her ultimate. Her skills include Inner Flame, a skill shot that explodes on impact, Focus Resolve, which links Karma's spiritual energy to her opponents, and Inspire, a barrier that also increases movement speed. Great abilities on their own, but Mantra grants Karma's next ability a great deal of power and utility. Inner Flame becomes Soul Flare, a projectile of greater power with an added slowing field that erupts for even more damage. Focus Resolve becomes Renewal, where the Tether does more damage and heals Karma based on percent health, and Inspire becomes Defiance, where Karma shields not only her target but also any teammates nearby, applying the movement speed boost to anyone shielded. What's even better is that Mantra is on a short cooldown, that only gets shorter any time Karma damages an enemy champion. So before you know it, Mantra will be back up and you'll be waiting for the opportune moment to use it based on how things play out. That's what I like about this ultimate the most, it forces Karma players to think and strategize, but also to adapt to the situation at hand, whether you land a wicked focus resolve slash soul flare combo, or use defiance to save your team from an enemy ambush. I know Karma isn't a highly popular champion, and Mantra is pretty underwhelming compared to most other ultimates in the game, but I feel that the potential of Mantra is still going untapped. What can I say? The power of the spirit compels me. Peace, no matter the cost. One thing that drew me to League of Legends was its emphasis on techmaturgy. I'm a huge fan of steampunk themes and the idea of technological wizardry, so looking at Piltover, it easily became my favorite realm in the League mythos. In terms of displaying the power of magic and technology in tandem, there were a lot of options, but I feel that Orianna is one of the best examples. 
she combines a complex but fun playstyle with one of the more compelling stories in the game. And her ultimate, Shockwave, is deceptively effective. By itself, Command Shockwave might not seem like much. Oriana creates an implosion around her ball that draws enemies towards it, dealing a heavy amount of AP damage in the process. By itself, Oriana has a lot of uses for this. By drawing enemies towards the ball, it sets up for more damage with Command Attack or Command Dissonance. In addition, the fact that it's an implosion as opposed to an explosion can be very disorienting. However, the true power of Command Shockwave is displayed when synchronized with a teammate. Oriana's third ability is Command Protect which shields Oriana, or preferably, an ally. The ball attaches to whomever it's shielding, and this makes setting up the ball for shockwaves more effective, and admittedly, more cathartic. There are so many possible combinations here. Zack's Elastic Slingshot, Malphite's Unstoppable Force, Katarina's Shumpo, Amumu's Bandage Toss into Curse of the Sad Mummy, Jarvan's Cataclysm, Galio's Idol of Duran, Scion's Unstoppable Force, Yasuo's Last Breath, the potential with this ultimate is endless. By itself, it's a pretty good ultimate. Combine it with a teammate, and it becomes a tool of pure devastation. Wow, sharing your toys is more fun. We will kill your enemies. That will be fun. So back in my top 10 scythe wielders, you might remember a spooky scary scarecrow called Fiddlesticks. And I will admit, I may have been too hasty with that decision. Fiddlesticks certainly wields a scythe pretty effectively, and it fits in regards to theming, but much of his viability comes from spells as opposed to weapon mastery. Thinking on it now, Hecarim might have been a better choice if his main skin actually had a scythe. Be that as it may, my love for Fiddlesticks has only gotten stronger over time. And sweet merciless magpies, his ultimate is amazing! After some channeling time, Fiddlesticks flashes a short distance, celebrating his arrival with Crowstorm, where a swarm of crows surrounds him, dealing AP damage over time to any enemies nearby. It's an excellent ultimate for teamfights, and it becomes more effective if Fiddlesticks hides using Zonia's Hourglass, which works since old Fiddlefaddle isn't exactly the tankiest champ around. And when combined with his Fear and Drain abilities, the damage really adds up. However, what I truly love about Crowstorm is how it's utilized. It's the League of Legends equivalent of a jump scare. Once Fiddlesticks is done channeling, he pops in with a bang, followed by the sounds of screeching birds and his ominous laughter. If the enemy isn't prepared, it will more than likely knock them out of their socks, and by the time they realize what's going on, Fiddlesticks has already sucked the life out of them. It's fun, it's effective, it's satisfying, and the only complaint I have is that Riot missed the opportunity to call it Murder of Crows. I feel your fear. So here we have the newest champion on this list that recently made it into the League roster. Echo was an immediate fan favorite with his do or die personality and his unique aspect on time manipulation. Sure we had Zillion, but I feel Echo exemplifies time combat a bit better. And his ultimate, Chrono Break, might be one of the most unique ultimates in the game. When Chrono Break is available, Echo leaves a time shift trail behind him, ending with an image where he was exactly 4 seconds in the past. Upon activation, Chrono Break sends Echo 4 seconds into the past, appearing with an explosion and replenishing a portion of the health he recently lost. With some healing done and his opponents potentially damaged from the blast, Echo literally becomes a comeback kid and Chrono Break makes him a serious threat in both duels and teamfights. I will admit that this is one of those abilities that's a bit of a pain to deal with in the counterplay aspect. As long as it's available, Echo has the ability to undo a lot of the work you just did and turn the fight around, meaning your best options are to either bait him into using it early, or take the ability away altogether, usually by silencing him. By and large though, that's about the only complaint I have about it. Chrono Break is fun, flashy, and very fitting for a Chronomancer. Hmm... Chronomancers... It's not how much time you have, it's how you use it. As we enter the top 10, let's look at a champion I've been dabbling with for some time now. Fiora the Grand Duelist combines a rushdown style with a high skill, high reward concept, and if played correctly, she can hold her own with big bursts of damage and blinding speed. Originally, I was going to put Blade Waltz on this list for how useful it was and for how pretty it looked. But Fiora has since gotten a rework in the not too distant past with a refined skill set and a completely new ultimate. And it is glorious! Yeah. 
grand challenge, along with her other refined abilities, was the drastic change of pace that Fiora sorely needed. No longer the glass cannon with a trigger-happy nutjob on the keyboard, Fiora now had the means to go about her battles with strategy, patience, and quick thinking. Like a grand duelist should. And the grand challenge is all of this cranked up to 11. Once activated, Fiora will reveal four weak spots on her selected opponent. Now boasting increased movement speed, Fiora has a limited time to attack all four weak spots to not only deal massive damage to the opponent, but also spawn a healing field to keep her and her teammates healthy while they continue to fight. What's more, the healing field will still manifest if the opponent dies after Fiora has tagged at least one of those weak spots. Before her rework, Fiora was nothing but a killing machine that would charge in and most likely die before her cooldowns went through, and she was really just a one-trick pony. But with Grand Challenge, suddenly Fiora becomes this calculating fencer with the capabilities of truly contributing to teamfights while still shining as the one-on-one -on -one duelist she's known to be. And on the other hand, fighting against Fiora requires just as much patience and skill, and once Grand Challenge targets you, suddenly a plethora of options are shoved your way. Do you risk trying to kill her before she can tag all of your weak points? Do you retreat and wait for the ability to wear off? What if you can't escape? Do you try to outmaneuver her to prevent her from exposing you fully? There are many ways to go about it, and not every scenario will have the same answer. Whether you're playing as her, with her, or against her, the strategic gambit is always present. And once the grand challenge is called, you know that the true test has begun. I long for a worthy opponent. Playing Katarina in League of Legends might be one of the riskiest, but also one of the more satisfying experiences in the game. She boasts ridiculous offense and crazy mobility to slip in, kill you, and slip out before her glass cannon stats get the better of her. Or in the case of her ultimate, Death Lotus, she will slip in, kill you, and kill everyone else around you. Death Lotus is an appropriate name for Katarina's ultimate, not just in terms of the character, but also in how it functions. Once activated, Katarina will start spinning at high speeds while delivering a barrage of daggers to up to three opponents surrounding her. This ultimate certainly doesn't have the power to take on a healthy team of five, but if the opposing team is injured enough, Katarina will be able to waste them in two seconds flat. Combined with her passive veracity, she even has the potential to perform this ultimate two times in one fight, a deadly rose that blooms twice. It's not just the high damage function that I love about Death Lotus, but also how it portrays Katarina herself. I may sound like a hopeless romantic here, but Katarina essentially becomes this beautiful flower, a blossom that is rare among the tyrannical city-state of Noxus. Even so, that lovely lotus has thorns. Lots and lots of thorns. And those thorns will soon deliver a patented kiss of death, leaving droves of wasted corpses at her feet. The more you look at it, Death Lotus is pure poetry, and Katarina is ready for her performance. Hey Jin, I think I may have just found your co-star. Let the bloodshed begin. All in all, I'm not a huge fan of the Void Champions. Cho'Gath never really appealed to me, Kog'Maw is one of the few AD carries I have no interest in, and I absolutely despise Kha'Zix. It wouldn't be until two years ago that a Void Champion would catch my interest. Vel'Koz. Now, ignoring all of the derogative hentai jokes, Vel'Koz is a lot of fun. He may be a slow-moving AP caster, but the way his abilities chain together makes for some really high potential damage. In addition, he has arguably the coolest looking and best named ultimate in the game. Lifeform Disintegration Ray. True to its name, Lifeform Disintegration Ray is a large laser that completely decimates any enemy caught in the blast while slowing their movement. What's even better is that this ability works in tandem to his passive, Organic Destruction, which deals true damage after three destruction stacks have been placed on the opponents. Work this ability to follow up after Vel'Koz's basic abilities, and not even the most resistant of opponents can withstand that devastating beam. As powerful as it is, however, it does have its weaknesses. Vel'Koz needs to be standing still when he uses this ability, and if he activates it at the wrong time, he's pretty much a sitting duck. I'm sure you're noticing a pattern with this list so far. I tend to favor abilities that have some level of counterplay to them. And in the case of Lifeform Disintegration Ray, the best way to combat it is to discourage Vel'Koz from actually using it. The beam by itself only causes a slowing effect along with the damage, so anyone fast enough can approach Vel'Koz if he were to carelessly let the beam loose at the wrong time. However, when combined with his other abilities or with the proper teamfight setup, Lifeform Disintegration Ray will not only destroy the enemy, but will also give Vel'Koz plenty of research material. 
the study of mutilated corpses and charred bodies.